Genesis chapter 18 is where we'll be today. <coughs> Last Sunday school lesson of 2023. Uh, speaking to a, a couple people throughout the week, other pastors, uh, a couple, one pastor in particular mentioned how at his church he just went through Revelation and Genesis at the same time. I said, man, that's, that's a big load. And uh, another pastor is working through, you just not too long ago went through the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews has a lot of connections to the book of Genesis. And our pastor, I think, is going to be preaching from Hebrews maybe this afternoon. But in the bulletin, if you get... If you get a hold of the bulletin at the top of both pages, there's verses from the book of Hebrews, and one of them specifically mentions Abraham, and Abraham and Sarah are human beings who exercised faith in God, and we're going to see, and we have seen already, they don't exercise that faith perfectly because they're humans, uh, like all of us here, right? We There's days where our faith uh, uh, lacks a little bit or... In an effort of faith, we construct some sort of idea on how we will accomplish that goal and maybe make a decision that wasn't the best of decisions. But today we're going to see in Genesis chapter 18, we will not finish the chapter. We'll end on a moment I think would make a pretty good cinematic moment, but uh, we're going to see something specifically with Sarah, what she does here. And without, without beating her up or being overly critical, we'll end on something I think would be a pretty good New Year's resolution, uh, at least some for, for, that will be good for me. So if we go to Genesis chapter 18, we say, it says in verse 1, and the Lord, this is Jehovah, right, capital L-O-R-D, appeared unto him, Abra Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. Uh, the plains of Mamre are also referred to as the plains of the oak or the plains of the oaks. In, sometimes in the, in the Bible, you might see the word terebinth, and that's just another word for oak tree. So this is a place where there's a significant oak tree or a, a number of oak trees, and this is where Abraham had returned to when he came back from Egypt. He had made an altar here, then he left for Egypt uh, during the time of the famine, and now he has returned. And uh, God appears to him here, and it says that Abram sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. It's a pretty simple act, right? This is midday, the hottest part of the day, and Abraham is taking his break for the day, his lunch break. And it says that he's sitting at the tent door. And the way in the ancient world, one scholar noted that the, the way that these tents were constructed, and it's also important to know that since Abraham is the patriarch, or if not patriarch, he is the chief, to use an older word, He's the chief of all this property. His tent is going to stand out from all the other tents, whether in its size or in its colors and its adornments. And that's an important detail we'll see in a minute. But we have here this very wealthy man. We know he's a great fighter. We think a couple of chapters back when he went and rescued Lot. This is a, he's a pretty respectable person, um, honorable. Uh, we might even say a great man and his wife Sarah the same, and yet he, like all of us, can't escape the heat, and he's got to sit down and take a break. And sitting in the tent, the tent door, the further you went, would go into the tent, even though the way they were constructed, like even today, it's going to get hotter. So as the day gets hotter, people would come closer and closer to the entryway of their tent, because that's where the air would be flowing, and you could also still sit in shade. And I just love that this opening passage, right after this big event where Abram, Abraham makes sure that all of his people are circumcised, he gets his name changed to Abraham, and yet he, like all of us, still has to have a very common moment of, i got to get out of the heat. I've just got to sit down. There's nothing I can really do right now. This is a very common moment, right? We might even say mundane or boring, Right? And it's fascinating how in a modern world, um, one of the things we are probably most, if not scared of, or most consciously, if not unconsciously trying to avoid, are boring moments. 
moments where there's not something happening, right? And uh, again and again, the different research that's coming out from a variety of scholars and people who are looking at the culture of the day, uh, the cell phones keep us distracted. We don't ever have to have a boring moment. And then when we find ourselves without it, like right now, and uh, it's, well, this is too slow. There's not enough happening. There's not enough, enough biz, you know, biz, bang, boom, bop to keep me focused. And so our attention, our attention uh, span starts to diminish. And I, what I want to focus on just this brief moment here with Abraham is he, like all of us, has a moment where he's sitting without anything really to do, right? He will go back out of work or he will check on his property as the day starts to cool. But part of the reason he can't do a whole lot is his age, right? And that's all coming our way, right? Age tells us you have to stop, you have to slow down. And then there's certain times in our life where we have to stop. We have nothing that really is going on. And yet in those mundane, boring moments, these are times when God can still speak to us. God can still come to us. And... Um, so just a small encouragement to all of us, if we have those moments where we're sitting in the car, and I know in our, in our own family, the second the car comes to a stop, the kids are like, what are we going to do? God forbid we sit here without a phone or without a song or without something going on, right? And we pick on them a little bit, but I even find myself, if I stop somewhere, if like just the other day, Elle and I were running an errand, she went into Starbucks to get something, and it took almost 23 minutes. I sat there for 23 minutes. I listened to a podcast, but I had to tell myself over and over again, don't go to your phone, don't go to your phone, don't look at your phone. And even a moment I thought, why do I even have something on? Why can't I just sit here in silence? Those are the moments, too. God can speak to us in large moments, right? Uh, there's an uh, announcement in a, the bulletin for the, the wilds this summer, right? That's a big week, a big event. A lot of exciting things happen that week, and a lot of God can come and speak to us in those days. But uh, God can even speak to us in those quiet, mundane, common, almost boring moments. And... Uh, if you find yourself being bored, that might be a good moment to just sit and say, I'm just going to sit and maybe commune with God and see what God says. And for some of us, those boring moments might come when we're lying in bed and we can't sleep, right? Those are long minutes or hours for some of us. So watch what happens to Abraham. He's sitting here in the tent in the heat of the day. He lifts up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by them. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, in the ancient world, if you looked up and saw, like in Abraham's case, he is the chief. His tent is going to be distinct from all the other tents. And the fact that these men were right there in front of his tent, it was their way of signaling to him, we have come to meet with you. We are interested in meeting you. And Abraham knows right away that one of these three men is the Lord. And look at his response here. He runs to meet them. This is an old man now running. And he bows himself to the ground, which was an Eastern practice. If you wanted to show deference to someone, you didn't just bow. You went all the way to the ground. And he says this, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. And Abraham, Abraham here, the chief of hundreds of people, a wealthy man is able to say to the Lord, I am your servant, right? You don't serve me, I serve you. And watch what Abraham says. Please stay here, and we're going to watch what Abraham does to serve these three visitors, one of them who is, as most scholars would say, this is Jesus Christ in earthly form. Verse 4, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, 
for therefore are ye come to your servant. So Abraham is saying, let me serve you. Let me get you some water. I'll wash your feet. I will feed you. And after we've had this moment together, then you can pass on to go do whatever it is you're supposed to do. But I know you have stopped this way for me to serve you. You have not just stopped here accidentally. I find it fascinating that Abraham doesn't take this as a moment of, you stopped here for me. What can I get? Instead, it's what can I give? What can I do? And they said unto him, so do as thou hast said. Okay, we'll stay here and you can do all these things. So watch what Abraham does. He hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. And one historian noted that this type of bread was very common. It could be made pretty quickly and it was made almost always by the women. And it was essentially their sort of flour and water, and they would knead it together, and there was fires that they had constantly going. And even if they were light fires or the ground had been heated, and they would put this bread under the ground, under the rocks, and it would cook almost instantly. So this, whatever she's making, is going to be made much faster than what Abraham's going to get ready, almost like an appetizer. So there's these, these flat pieces of bread. And seven, Abraham ran unto the herd, fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And the way that this meat is going to be cooked, uh, because we know that this, this can take a while, there were several ways that they would, they would cook the meat at this time. They would skin it and take the innards out and then just skewer the entire animal and roast it over an open fire. Or in this case, if they were trying to be faster, they would skin it, disembowel it, and then make sure they cut it up into very small pieces and skewered those pieces of meat on a skewer and then set them over the fire. They would cook much faster. And so this is probably what Abraham's having done with this, with this calf. And they dress it, verse 8, and he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. So milk is here something to drink. That's a precious commodity. They could, of course, of course serve water. And then most people in the ancient world were drinking wine of some sort uh, because that was less likely to be, um, have gone bad and spoiled, but milk was a, if you're giving someone milk, you're treating them well. But they would have a bowl that the meat would be in, and it would be with corn, and then butter in this case, or fat of an animal, and that bowl would be heated, and they would take the bread, and they would break the bread, and they would dip it in that bowl, and eat it with the bread, and then once it all cooled off and the bread was done, then they used their hands. I'll pass. But they would eat there. So he's, he has taken the time to wash their feet, to give them water. He has fed them of the best of what he could at that moment. And they did eat. And now we go into verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. I will come back to you as it is appointed a year from now, basically, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. So for whatever reason, she's not out there eating with them. These men are eating under the tree. Abraham is standing beside them, eating with them and waiting on them. He is serving them. And when they ask about the wife, she's in the tent, she's listening. Verse 11, now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. So not only old, but being well stricken, there are things now they're unable to do. And the verse goes on and tells us, what was it? It ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She is no longer able to bear children. Biologically, scientifically, she cannot bear children and her husband cannot either, right? Verse 12, therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. So this is not a huge laugh. She does not make this known. This is all within herself. She laughs, saying... After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. The pleasure of having a child, right? And raising a child. Am I going to be able to do this? Even though the whole reason Abraham and Sarah are here in Mamre is they left Ur of the Chaldees because God told Abram and Sarah, I will give you a land of your own and a nation of your own. And yet, if we see anything in the life of Abraham and Sarah, they are constantly having to wait. 
and a question is worth thinking about, we won't go down and answer, but what are, what are we waiting on right now? We go around the room individually. This is one thing I'm waiting on right now. Whether it's today's meal, something at the end of life, something that's coming next year, right? We all have things we're waiting on. And Abram is waiting on this huge promise. And of course, one thing we all have in common here as believers is we are all waiting on that huge promise of Christ is going to return. He is going to bring peace on earth. He is going to wipe out the enemies. That day is coming. And we share that in common with Abraham, and we share that in common with everyone in the New Testament church, who when you study the writings of Paul, Paul's constantly saying, Christ will return. Christ will return. And waiting is very difficult to do. Verse 13, and, and Sarah's response is very human, right? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? And now we have the next massive question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too difficult for God to accomplish? Is there anything that God cannot understand? course, the answer to that question is no. But just for fun, what is something that is too hard for us? It might be just specifically too hard for you. Like the other day, there, there was a possibility that I was going to have to handle the gate at the tournament, which would involve lower math, and I, it's like, no way. I was relieved when someone else said, hey, I'll take that over. It's like, man, that's, that's beyond me, right? What is something that's too hard for us as humans, too difficult to understand or do? Very good. Getting older, not doing the things I was used to doing. Yeah. What's too hard for you? What's well, something you don't understand? Death? Death? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's coming. It's difficult. All the universities are struggling with AI. Just had a meeting about it this week. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Here's an idea. Here's a plan. This will work. It probably won't. It isn't. And also, I think you talk about letting God have things on some judgment and sometimes knowing when you should take action and when you should not. Yeah, it's good. So the sin of others reaching out and touching the innocent, we don't know how it will do that and in what way. We can't stop it. Or it takes a while to stop knowing when to take vengeance. The reason I ask, what is it that we cannot do, is because usually when we stop and think what we cannot do, it will help us remember that God cannot not do anything, <laughs> right? It's a good thing to keep in mind, because we are now on the cusp of the new year when we all make our New Year's resolutions, all these things that we can do. And it's good to remember that even if we can do them, it is by the, the grace of God and by the power of God giving us that ability. It's also important to remember that there is nothing that God cannot do. And so here's just a, a list, a short list written down of the things that it is impossible for humans to do. Ready? We cannot create. We cannot create like God can create, right? Ex nihilo, out of nothing. We cannot just speak something and it comes into existence. It's very hard for us to forgive. And one forgiveness that we cannot do is we cannot forgive the sins of the world. 
several times throughout the Old Testament, there will be characters who will offer themselves up as the atoning sacrifice for their people. And God will say no, because human beings cannot do that. There's a lot of instruction that we can't give. And one instruction we cannot give is we cannot instruct God, as Paul will say. Are we the counselors of God? Even though when we come back next week, we're going to see a fascinating moment between Abraham and God. And David Guzik points out as this is a fascinating reminder to us is what prayer is. It's not prayer instructing God, but it is a way of calling to our memory the things that God can do. But it's very hard for us to instruct each other, instruct ourselves, and certainly cannot instruct God. And this ties into the formation of a soul. How do you rightly form who you ought to become? A lot of the world philosophy is you can fix yourself, you can form yourself. And while there is a lot of personal responsibility that we have to decide to take, it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that our souls can be formed rightly. And again, we cannot save ourselves and we cannot save each other. We can rescue someone out of a you know, a river, we can hand, help someone out financially in a moment, we can give them a job, we can give birth to someone and keep them alive, we can help one another in those ways, but we cannot ultimately save the soul of ourselves and our fellow man. And then lastly, we cannot transfigure ourselves. Although we do live at a time where it is common now where you can transform yourself, you can say what you want to be, you can take physically violate your own body to be what you want to be. And yet is, as Scripture tells us, that ultimate transfiguration in which our bodies and our souls are glorified, that is all an act of, that God has to ultimately take over. These are all things that we have to trust God and place faith in God for. There is certainly a part of us that is involved in it, but it's still ultimately, ultimately God who's going to get it done. It's a very powerful question here. So the this, the Lord says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Big question, right? He responds and says again, at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. I'm going to come back, Sarah and Abraham, at the time that it's designated, and she is going to have a son, and Sarah shall have a son. Watch what Sarah says. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not. You know what humans are very good at? Lying. <laughs> Denying. I didn't do that. That wasn't me. Notice why she lies, though, because there's a variety of reasons why we lie. We can lie to put ourselves forward because we want attention. We can lie for several other reasons, but here's a very fundamental reason why Sarah lies. It's, it tells us right here, she was afraid. And all of us in the room have probably many times we go around and say, I lied because I was afraid. I was afraid of what so-and-so would think, or I was afraid of the punishment that would come my way, right? So she's very human. This is not beating up on her, but it's good to sit here and think, man, clearly she laughed, even within herself, and the Lord who knows the very thoughts and intents of our hearts says, why did she laugh? He didn't come after her. He just asked that question, and we see a similar question in the, in, the book of, in, in the Garden of Eden. Why did you hide yourselves? He knows the answer. He knows the reason. And instead of Sarah saying, I laughed because I don't think it's going to happen. I doubt. I don't. I'm struggling, right? When God comes to Adam and Eve, why did you hide yourselves? If Adam had come forward and said, because I disobeyed, I sinned. And yet he was afraid. He tries to blame Eve, right? Eve's afraid. She blames the serpent. Here, Sarah is afraid, and she lies and says, I didn't do it. And I love how this moment ends. The Lord simply says, nay, you did laugh. He doesn't escape. He doesn't excuse. He doesn't say, well, you're living your truth. He just ends the moment with, no, you did laugh. And now Sarah's got to take that. And she's got to deal with that. And if we're looking into the new year, right, then we can start with the day, just a few things to end on here. 
may we continue to trust the promises of God. God probably has a promise for you, an individual promise for you. Maybe God has spoken to you and said, I'm, this will happen. I, I will take care of this. But we don't necessarily know when that will take place. But we do all share a promise of God that he is going to return. We have share the promises of God that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We might have a hard time forgiving and forgetting and moving beyond, but God, if we come to him in a contrite heart, will forgive us and will not hold that over us. We can have our, our relationship restored to him. So may we enter this new year with a, with a recommitment, uh, one of our New Year's resolutions to better trust God and the promises of God. Secondly, may we not lie even if compelled by fear. Fear is very powerful, right? And if we do lie or we do fail, as Beck said, we all, all of us sin, may we repent. And repent especially when God reveals to us, whether it's through our fellow man or through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you did not do right here and you have lied here. May we repent and try to make that right. Um, in the book, it's called The Brothers Karamazov. It's considered part of the, one of the greatest books ever written, and I'm just working through it now. Uh, there's a passage in which a woman, a very, a very pious woman, a religious woman, comes to this elder, and this is more under Roman, um, Russian Orthodox Church, so it's going to be closely related to Catholicism, but there's some great truth still here. She comes to this elder, and she confesses something. And the elder very aptly asks her, have you confessed this fault in you just so I will praise you for this? Do you really want to, through the power of, the, of Christ, make this thing right in your life? And she, it's very impressive. She says, no, I, I came to you in a pious act to get praised for my piety, I, which is a sin, right? And then from there, the elder goes on and says, if you truly want to repent and be right with Christ, here's just, he, he sends her off with some advice. And he said, this is a passage from that. He says, above all, avoid lies, all lies, especially the lie to yourself. And if there's one thing we really cannot avoid, it is, it is lies. We are surrounded by it, Right. I just had a conversation the other day, and I'm sure if any one of us sat down and talked about anything, we'd probably all fall back and say, well, what can you really trust, right? What can we really know is true? What can we really believe? And we are bombarded with things. Uh, just trying to watch anything now, even on a streaming service, if there's any sort of commercial break, we all know what those commercials are going to be, right? They're going to be for medicine, almost exclusively. And then when, because they know that medicine won't solve our problems, they offer us cars. Because that'll solve our problems, right? And there's a variety of other commercials that are being advertised out there, right? But we're constantly being advertised. There's, there's, there's lies abounding all over. But I love that the, the priest here in this moment tells her, we must strive to avoid lies, but especially those lies to ourselves. Because one place where we can almost not escape lies is we will lie to ourselves says, avoid lies, and then he tells her, and avoid fear. For fear is simply the consequence of every lie. Each time we lie, it doesn't make the fear go away. The fear might kind of leave like a gnat, but it's going to come back again with more, with more gnats. It's going to come back larger and larger. And uh, so as we end here, this, this past today, we'll move on just a little bit further but a, a, just a big idea to end with is the, the willingness to strive to tell the truth as much as possible, especially to ourselves, and be receptive of the truth when it comes to us, even when it's, hey, you did wrong here. You erred here, being willing to repent. And I love that Sarah here is not cast off. She's not cast out. When we get to the book of Hebrews, she is still a woman of faith. She will put her trust back in God. And she's an excellent example of someone who gets back up and keeps going. But we're going to end here. We're getting to verse 16. The men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, 
and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. It was customary in the ancient world when your guests went to leave, you as the host walked out a little bit with them. And today we might have this where you stand on the door and wave or you walk them out to their car. And um, Duke and Ford, whenever we go and visit them and drive out, they like to run down the side of the road to say goodbye for a little bit, right? But Abraham is being a good host. He's going out with them. And we have here, the Lord said, he's talking to the two other men that are with him, which we will see later. These are angels. He says, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, God is not asking this question of the angels because he doesn't know what to do. He is asking this question, and the writer of the book of Genesis is recording it so we can get an insight into the nature of God and into what kind of human should I be. If Abraham is going to be the father of a great nation, what type of individual should Abraham be? But then what type of nation should a nation be? And we will see next week an example of what type of individual and nation not to be when we get into Sodom and Gomorrah. So God is speaking to his angels and says, should I hold this from him knowing that he's going to become this great nation? Verse 19, for I know him. He will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, right? One of the greatest things a family can do, parents can do, is to instruct their children and then their children's children to go in the ways of the Lord. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, so he's going to talk now. He's talking now to the angels, and I think he's now talking to Abraham. Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me, and if not, I will know. God already knows, but he is demonstrating to believers when God makes a decision, he does not make a decision just off the cuff. He has evidence. His decisions are good and they are wise. Why? Because he knows everything and he knows the ramifications of all the choices he will make. And the judgment he's going to level on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is not because he woke up and had, was having a bad day, right? The evidence is there that these are evil people. And the men, these are the two angels, they turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. So God has said, we're going to go down and check the evidence out to see if I need to judge them. Notice what Abraham says here. Abraham knows Sodom and Gomorrah are not good places. Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near, right, draws near unto God, and he says, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Will you destroy the righteous and the wicked? One of the most common arguments against God and against faith in God is how can he allow bad things to happen to good people? How can he allow suffering to happen in the world? And a good God would not send anyone into hell or would not judge harshly anyone. And one of the things we're going to see in this passage is God does not judge harshly or incorrectly anyone. If anything, he is always merciful. But there are those, Lucifer being the highest example, but even in the human race, there are those who will reject and reject and reject. They will live by a lie. And they will have to answer for that. But Abraham has asked such a beautiful question. When you de destroy this city, are you also going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And we'll come back next week and see how God answers that. And we'll see the faithfulness, the mercy that Abraham has for these people in Sodom and Gomorrah, specifically because Lot lives there. And he does care for his, his nephew Lot. Thank you.